it on with a uh, broken, like a stylus, a pointed, a pointed, um, pointed stick, essentially, making the the uh, the marks in it, the wedge state shaped um, symbols, which are syllabic in origin, and you bake it, and that in itself then influences what we call something the language of proto sinaitic early uh, early early writing again on potsherds inscribed on stone that fundamentally uh after it meets the egyptians in a little bit and i'm kind of going over this quickly gives us the phoenician alphabet that gives us the greek alphabet and here again we have a greek kylix this comes from a little later of the time of the dark ages uh, the dark age it's an archaic piece with the greek alphabet around it so we're we're drawing on our ability to even write um, epic poetry from thousands of years of languages that influence the language and the expression. If we put this into epic tradition, and many of you, if not all of you, I'm sure have heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and many of you have read it. I know many of you have read it because I assigned it last semester. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is preserved in part here on this tablet, this is one of the broken, it's in multiple, multiple tablets found over a course of, of multiple excavations. This is one of the larger fragments of the Gilgamesh Epic from easily 3000 before the Common Era, and it gives us our first and our longest epic tradition. So long before Homer and the Odyssey, we have a tradition again of epic poetry. And what is, I mean, epic poetry, it's, you know, epic, right? It, it's, it involves heroes, it involves quests, it is long, it is involved, it gives us values, it gives us ideals. So we are placing the Odyssey and placing Homer and the tradition of writing like this in a much, much longer context. Gilgamesh, as is, I think, fairly well known, tells the story of a, of a fictional king who goes on a quest to discover the meaning of life and to see if he can overcome death. Uh, he fails signally to overcome death, coming to the conclusion that it is the human condition is to be mortal, but he does manage to come up with uh, a number of statements about the meaning of life and what you should value in life. You'll notice we're coming back to values. So not only does Gilgamesh come to the sad but true conclusion that all humans are mortal, but then he comes to the conclusion that the meaning of life is to live a good life and to live it well to the best of your ability and to leave behind you something that people will remember you by. And that's how you achieve immortality. Also in the tale of the epic, the epic that gives us values and that gives us a hero and that gives us ideals and standards that cultures can base their ideas on, <clears throat> excuse me, is the tale of Sinue from Egypt. That's this here, or a portion of it on papyrus that's been straightened out, that's been rolled. So, and Sinue, so about a thousand so odd years later, tells the story of an epic adventure of an Egyptian courtier who has the signal misfortune to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when the ruling king is assassinated. And being afraid that he was obviously because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, being afraid that he will be implicated in this, goes on a rather long and arduous journey from Egypt across the desert up into the southern Levant, into ancient Canaan, and what, what will eventually become ancient Israel, and undergoes all sorts of trials and tribulations, merely starving in the desert or dying of thirst in the desert, and fighting off, uh, uh, exhibiting his military prowess, um, save, eventually marrying the right woman, or save, marrying the, 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 the chieftain's daughter, and finally, eventually, at the end of his epic journey and his quest, making it back to Egypt so that he can live a comfortable old age surrounded by family, uh, uh, the correct lifestyle, um, the values of, again, of, of a family, allegiance to the king, lifestyle, morals, and values. And then we have the Iliad and the Odyssey. So to contextualize them again, we are now putting Homer or um, Homer and, and Odysseus and all of his, his peregrinations and his trials and tribulations in the context of 
a very long tradition, there are other epics out there, these two are the most famous, Gilgamesh and Sinue, of human cultures having a protagonist who is traveling around, either trying to get home or trying to find something, undergoing all sorts of challenges along the way, and the ways in which he meets them then reflects on the values and the ideals and the morals of the culture as they go forward. So now we have put the Odyssey in place. I should also say, if people have questions as they're going along, um, and you don't want to wait till the end, throw them in the chat box or speak up, and I will do my best to, to answer them as, as we move along. So the Iliad and the Odyssey, right, it comes up with, we have the quest, we have the hero, we have honor, and again, here is a sort of a stylized version of, of Odysseus, presumably between Scylla and Charybdis, and this here is a Rome, it's a Roman bust of, of Homer, um, it's sort of with the Roman ideal of what he should have looked like, and again, he looks very noble, uh, as sort of a bearded man with a diadem. So he, he reflects now, this bust of, of, of Homer done by the Romans, reflects how the Romans feel Homer must have looked as the man who wrote about the quest and the hero and the and honor and virtue and strength and military prowess. And also in the Odyssey, although it's not, it's about those first ones, right? It's about being, a, having all these wonderful ideals. We also get just a little bit of information about gender, right? Uh, you're going to read the Penelope ad next week, but we know that while Odysseus is traveling around the world, Penelope is sitting at home, um, weaving and unweaving, as the case might be, waiting for him to come back. So she doesn't figure so strongly, or she figures in a certain way in the Odyssey. She is the faithful wife waiting for him to come home. So she also is giving us the idea of honor and virtue and the correct values as exhibited by women. We also get some views of maybe different classes of people. Um, and again, many of you know the answer to this, but we're talking about epic literature. And this, again, how many people in the ancient world could read or write? And who were they? So we're talking about less than 1%, maybe 2% as we get into Greece and Rome, it gets, it gets increased as we get more writing, we get more literacy, and predominantly male and predominantly elite. So again, we're getting perhaps different views of different classes. Uh, if you get conquered in battle, you certainly get captured and you end up in, in different classes of people. Not everybody is going to be the honorable, heroic warrior wandering around. And of course, the Greek values versus other. So we have ideas from earlier traditions, they've been adapted, they've been adopted, and while also promoting these wonderful ideas about quest and hero and honor and virtue and strength and prowess and family and all of this, we also get some other kind of interesting glimpses into different society out there. So uh, what about gender, class, and character, right? So we have Women in ancient Greece, a variety of different status, depends on where you lived, right? Uh, in Athens, you might be considered a citizen, but you certainly aren't gonna vote. Barred from all political activity and any activity that was acceptable, and here I am talking about upper-class women, elite women. Activities were confined predominantly in the household, absolutely not in public or in public view. And so the woman, the woman's role, her gender role in, in Greece um, as set out there. And you can see this in some ways in Penelope, in, in, in the figure of Penelope, who is at home being almost a perfect Greek wife, that you are the duty is to bear children, right? Preferably sons. And the marriage formula in Athens is I give this woman for the procreation of legitimate children. So a woman, again, would go from family household to husband household, right? In Sparta, and I'm sorry, my, my uh, image is over that a little bit. Women in Sparta had certainly more um, rights, could own and inherit land, could do, have athletic training, um, could participate in the games. But again, this is elite women. And we see women also working as priestesses, women working as prostitutes. And then again, the entire lower class of women. So one thing again about a classic is we don't 
the classic gives us the classical values, but we also then have to consider a large proportion of the rest of the population. There's also class. And there's upper class and there's lower class. There's there's the, the, there's other classes of people besides uh, you know other than just free and slave. The free classes had different cl had different gradations and then as did slave classes. But broadly speaking, slaves are everywhere, right? It, it, it is the Greek world was a slave based economy, and these are some of the ways, of course, that you could become a slave. One could be born into slavery. One could be captured in battle and war, again, something that we would see in the Odyssey and the Iliad and the Odyssey, what is happening to the defeated people. One could sell oneself into slavery to, or you could sell a family member, which I guess would be, you know, so you could sell your children, so to speak, to pay debts or to meet economic um, requirements. And you could always be uh, taken into slavery, uh, slavers and pirates. Again, this is the Mediterranean Sea that has Pirate, the history of piracy in the Mediterranean is cool, but we'll deal with that later. Uh, piracy has always been in the Mediterranean. And so, again, we are talking about um, class from the Dark Ages through classical Greece and into Rome. I'm not dealing with Rome in this talk at all. Um, but the Roman economy was also ex absolutely predicated on having a class of slave labor. Um, to, for agriculture, for the fields, for industry, for mining. Um, any kind of mining, um, which is was especially in the ancient world, dark, dirty, unhealthy, and a very short lifespan, would have been done predominantly by enslaved persons. And then there's the personal slaves, the household slaves, and gradations there, and in some cases, slaves in the military. So it's necessary to Greek life. And again, we get references from it. We can see it in some here. Again, we have images. This is the image of a fine Athenian lady, right, who is, appears to be managing her household. And so the the pers it's the visual image of what a lady should in fact look like, right? But we can assume that the potter was was giving us this ideal. And then likewise, here we have, and you can sort of see by that, the, the, just the lack of garments is a visual indicator some of the times of status, that you have a group of slaves here working on one of the agricultural estates. It looks like they're you know, doing something here to get fruit from the trees or some kind of agricultural activity. So again, this is normal um, and endemic and throughout the Greek, uh, Greek ancient world. That is again, giving us both classic views and also we see that it gives us insight and that we should not in fact forget the majority of the population. You haven't read the Penelope ad yet, but the Penelope ad, even though it's by a modern author, right, who is in fact pointing to this very, this very fact that while the Odyssey is playing up um, as it should do, as an epic poem, the epic poem is talking about the, the great actions of the hero and honor and virtue and all of these ideals, that there's more than 85% of the population then that is, is left out that we don't hear about or who doesn't benefit from these classic ideals in the same way. I'm gonna move somewhat quickly -er through, um, as I said, so that there is time for questions and things like that. And I think someone told me 40 or 50 minutes here, but the same idea of image and art. So moving away from, so from text and what we get and what we don't get in, this, in the tradition of writing, we also generally get our ideas of art and imagery from the Greek and Roman classical world, right? That the, and by aesthetics, right? Aesthetics are of course what we find, if you say you find something aesthetically pleasing, it is visually pleasing. Aesthetically displeasing, we think it's ugly, it's out of proportion, it's wrong. And the imagery. And this looks very comfortable to us. We are, uh, we, we get ideals again, and this is the visual confirmation of the same ideals that we see in the Odyssey, right? Here we have, a, this is a statue of one of the Greek gods, but again, the sort of the perfect male form, and he is, he's missing his spear, but uh, you know, exhibiting again, the values of military prowess and um, sort of oozing honor and, and strength and all of that. This looks funny to us. 
and again, some of you who sat through Western Civ last semester know, have seen this before, this looks different to us, right? It's a completely different way, aside from the fact that one is a, one is a wall sculpture and one is a sculpture in the round, just dealing with the, the, the differences of there, it is a very different way of presenting humans. This is from ancient Egypt, circa 2000. And it's certainly not that the Egyptians couldn't give us the imagery, the, uh, an, a, a, a two scale, completely proportional human figure. They chose not to. What they're doing instead is giving as absolute much information about the human body as possible. So what they're trying to show people both from the front and from the side and to show motion of arms and legs to give as absolute much information about the scene as possible. So these objects that are sitting on a table here are not unrealistically piled up. It's a way of showing you what's on top of the table that if we had done this in proportion or in the correct view that we, or what we call the correct view, the correct Western view of proportion, the canon of proportion, we wouldn't be able to see those materials. And so we are presenting a different type of imagery. So again, here we have something that looks terribly familiar to us, right? Again, and for Greek imagery, the nude male was the absolute standard of aesthetics, right? Uh, the nude male form was, again, meant to provide imagery of uh, virtue, honor, strength, um, uh, a, a proportion, uh, pleasingness. And again, some of you have seen this before, this looks odd. What's wrong with this fellow? I mean, aside from the fact that there's a human head on a bull with wings and it doesn't appear naturally in nature. Uh, there are six legs in total. Yeah, uh, five actually. Oh, but five, yeah. yeah. Five legs in total. So if you look at him, this is a Lamasu, it's a guardian figurine that's meant to inspire the, 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 the viewer with a certain amount of awe and fear. They, they were on the entranceways to the, um, to, the, to the throne room of the king. So there'd be one on each side there. So you would pass between them on your way to go see the king in Mesopotamia. So it should be inspiring awe and a little bit of anxiety probably. So from the side, he's got four legs and from the front, it looks, you would see him standing there. So again, What's being shown is as fundamentally coded to the society that produces it. And so you say, so what? So we are used to seeing this type of imagery and we get our sense of aesthetics and correctness and the ideals that go with it again is coded to us. Um, and the, when this statue was first brought to the British Museum by the British um, adventurers and explorers who acquired it, it made headlines in the Illustrated London Gazette because there was this huge uproar in the British Museum, this is in the 1870s or so, that the upper British classes, the, the gentleman society, again, the ones who were trained in the classics, the mark of an educated man for, for centuries was knowledge of the classics, and that included text and image, was, and the, the, there was this huge uproar because it was not clear that the British Museum should give exhibition space to what was described as degraded art or inferior or or I mean, a number of negative and derogatory terms it was not it was it was yeah degraded and um uh, somehow not good art because this imagery it was being compared to this imagery and for many centuries this imagery is what the world was sort of coded to see as as proper aesthetics as the correct form of sculpture so they ended up in the british museum but a lot of people were deeply unhappy with it and now of course this has become one of the great um it's one of the great galleries of the british museum is the mesopotamian art ones so ideas have changed but that was the initial one so we have text we have image and then we have idea or our value or our values and of course from the Greeks, and I, if I ever ask a class, whenever I ask a class, you know, what do we get from the Greeks, right? 
we get a lot of answers about what we have gotten from the Greeks. We have gotten literature, we have gotten the idea of democracy, notwithstanding the fact that in a Greek democracy, only the top 10% of the population could vote. Um, you know, it's a, but at least the, the concept we get from the Greek, we have science, we have knowledge, and we almost always get Greek philosophy. And this one's kind of fun, right? So we absolutely get Greek. I'm going to bet that somewhere along the line in texts and critics or in high school or in college or somewhere along the line, people have read Plato and Socrates, right? The sort of quintessential Greek philosophers. Again, foundational, they're the classics. They are the classic philosophers of the Western world. And so philosophy, like the epic poem, Image, not so much. We've seen images very different, but like the epic poem, philosophy, Greek philosophy and these values, again, we can trace centuries back into the earlier world. So philosophy means the love of wisdom, Philo and Sophie. And Sophia was the Greek goddess of wisdom. So again, gendered, a goddess of women, gendered female. So that, of course, raises the logical question of what is wisdom? If you love it, what is it? Some of you do, I think, know the answer. If not, if you don't want to, that's okay too. Anyone want to take a stab at wisdom? Wisdom's fun. Wisdom is more than just being knowledgeable, right? We talk about a wise old man or a wise old person, a wise old woman or something like that. Well, we think they have a lot of, they, they have a lot of knowledge about the world. And that is essentially that wisdom is the knowledge of the nature of the universe, the place of the divine and humans within it, and if you have the knowledge of the nature of the universe, then you should have a knowledge of, yeah, the place of humans. Think back to Gilgamesh's quest. He is looking for what it means to be human. He discovers humans are mortal. Sinue goes forth and has all sorts of adventures and discovers that being at home in his home country with his family and in his monarchy, that that is the correct place for him. That is his place in the universe. Odysseus travels all over the greater Mediterranean, fighting all sorts of things, of course, trying to, again, win his way home to his wife and his family. So it is in some ways speaking to the nature of this is broad, more broadly thinking of what is the nature of humans and the nature of the universe and where are humans supposed to be? And wisdom, again, we actually, in this case, we get from the Egyptians. The Mesopotamian material is a little bit later, as you can see. Uh, the Egyptian wisdom literature, there is an entire body of literature, text after text after text from as early as 3000, that talks about how you live correctly. And it sets up what there's always the wise man versus the fool. The wise man will do this, that, and the other thing, the foolish man doesn't do this because and he's an idiot and it doesn't work out very well. And that we fundamentally get ideas that it talks about everything from as ridiculous or as, as minor as table manners as to ideas about how to act, um, how to be, you know, how to behave, how to consider yourself human, how to place yourself in the world around you. And this here, which again, I think is a very well-known scene, many of you will have seen it, is what's called the negative confession. It's an early piece of wisdom literature where were you to be dead as an ancient Egyptian, uh, in the, you're not only, you are judged before the goddess of Ma'at, the goddess of Ma'at is the world as it is supposed to be, the order of the world, also a goddess. And so as we can trace Sophia in some ways through a lot of different permutations, it's not a direct line in any way, shape or form, but this idea that there is a goddess who represents the correct order of the world. Uh, this is the dead person here um, praying before the deities. His heart is weighed on the scale and the heart is weighed against the feather that sits on Ma'at's head. So you weigh your what your deeds have done against the correct living in the world. And then it is written down in front of, again, a symbol of the order of, of, of having lived correctly. All of this, this is far more interesting. This is just, this, this shows the imagery that goes with it. This, all of this is individual statements that as a person, you were supposed to say, you did not steal, you did not cheat, you did not murder, you did not um, disrespect your parents, you did not disrespect your elders. It is a list, uh, you did not um, 
uh, swear before the, uh, swear falsely before the gods. There is list after list after list after list of what you should, what you say you didn't do, because by not doing it, you proved that you were a good person. And it's called the negative confession because you say that you did not do it. So that you proved you have lived according to wisdom. And so we start with the Egyptians, we go through the Mesopotamians, and it comes back to us these ideas again in Greek philosophy, Greek literature, Greek art, and Greek ideals. And in some cases, directly into what will eventually be, of course, the one of the great works of the Western world, which is the biblical literature. This is Ecclesiastes or Kohelet, who tells us in the biblical text, the author says that he applied his heart, his idea, to inquire and search for wisdom in everything that was done under heaven. Ben Sirach, 24, tells us, that all wisdom comes from God, so and, and it was created before all things and prudent from understanding. The Greek philosopher Zeno tells us that reason is, what he calls concatenated reason, is always with the gods, that there is reason with the gods. And what's really quite interesting is that if you are reading Zeno and he says concatenated, concatenated reason is with the gods, Concatenation, concatenated reason in Greek is logos, which of course gets us to the idea that is reflected in the gospel according to John, chapter one, line one, in the beginning there was the, where there was logos and the logos was with God. So again, we have these ideals of behavior that are, have their roots, can be pushed back for thousands of years meet in the epic poem and in, in epic poem and, and then the traditions that are associated um, with, whoops, sorry, with the Greeks. Oh dear, that was not what was supposed to happen. Bear with me. As I said, not good with the Zoom presentation or the WebEx presentation for that matter. And we, I'm now on the right screen. So we have all these ideas that go back for thousands of years, right? Um, again, not so much imagery. Imagery, in some ways, we don't have as much influence from the past worlds, but we have a very strong sense of what the Greek classical imagery should be. And many, many of our modern standards, values, can be traced to Greek culture. They can be traced back to the views and the values of the cultures that have preceded them. We see them in the Odyssey. You read the Odyssey. The Odyssey is fabulous. And it reflects many of those, right? And so that's why, again, we read the Odyssey. We, it's a classic. It is set in curriculum and culture. And those legacies then, we're still reading them. We still focus on the classics. We still find those values and ideals are still held dearly in various parts of society. But, right, it only reflects a very, very small portion of the peoples of the ancient world. We are reading the material and seeing the imagery and getting the ideals again of a certain proportion of the world, the, of the ancient world that gives us these ideals. So again, I understand you read the Penelope ad next week, which is awesome, right? And it, it's, it's a, a pro, so a modern, a modern author then saying, well, let's look at the voices and the views and the values and the experiences of those people. Let us look here. Here again, we have a woman with her female servant is standing in front of her. Let us look at the slaves. This is an image of slaves mining, again on Greek imagery. This one I've chosen, this is not Greek. This is a Mesopotamian figure. It's a Sumerian figure. So it's from about 3,500-ish BC. So it is old and it, shows a tradition of, of an old man here. You can see he's kind of an older man. And it reflects the tradition of worshipers going to the Sumerian temples. And again, they're not literate. They're not upper class. They're not going to be anything like that. And to leave an offering so that maybe the gods, if you live according to wisdom, if you live according to wisdom and you leave an offering and you're a good person, maybe you will have the correct place in life. And so here's this image, a little statue. So you'd leave behind a statue to show that you'd been there. You'd leave behind a little, a little image saying that you'd been there. And this gentleman here 
is obviously bringing his little lamb, his little sheep, and going to be a good person in the ancient world. And we don't have his voice, but we have his image. And so all together, if we bring it back to classics, and I think that, whoops, that was it. We have, I'm oh, sorry, if we bring it back to the classics, the classics, again, give us a wonderful set of ideals and text and image and ideas. And we perhaps also then remember, and the Penelope ad would do that, is that there's lots of other ways and views to look at the rest of the world that is left out by the classics. And with that, I think I read a little over time. I apologize. I am done. And thank you very, very much, if you are still out there. And I will thank stop sharing you. the screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. Um, we are now going to go into our questions section. If anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask a question or type in the chat, we've got one in the chat. Um, I see one in the, let me, oh, now I can see my chat box, so. Great. <laughs> okay. For the sake of the YouTube presentation, um, I will still read those questions out loud. Um, okay. That's okay, Dr. Coram. Yes, please. Uh, so the question reads, which record is more valuable to your own research, the visual or written historical record? Which economy, the written or visual, is more prosperous today for researchers in your field? Oh, gosh, I'm going to have to say both. Because from my own research in the ancient world, the text gives us a huge amount of information that we can't get from the object or the thing, right? Because you can people can write down abstract concepts more easily than they can sculpt them in some ways. But there's also always the concern when you go when you're that far sort of back in time is the writing in and of itself is also an artifact. Like you, so the question is of course going to be who who wrote it and what was context was it found in and everything. So ideally what we end up with in, in my field is you have people who specialize in language. I'm not one of them. You have speak, people who specialize in the artifact that is more in my line of work, but there is, it has to be a dialogue between the two. You have to use them together. Um, I don't think that actually answered your question, but um, there are people out there who do all of that, um, both image and text. Somebody else want to ask me something? Somebody has to have a question. Otherwise, I wonder whether I blithered by myself for like 50 minutes or something, so. Uh, I actually have a question. Um, oh, I will read Zachary's first. Yeah, uh, what inaccuracies have there been in interpreting ancient Greece that have affected our culture? I saw a documentary about how ancient statues and buildings were not purely white. They just got bleached over time, but this has influenced modern design, for instance. Oh, absolutely. Only in the latter part of the 20th century was it realized, like, again, that pure white marble statue was held up as this gorgeous, you know, this aesthetic, you know, ideal. And then it did come to light. And that, that's exactly true, that the Greek statues and the buildings would have been painted in these bright, bright colors. So try to imagine, like, um, you know, the, 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 the ones I just showed or the Diana statue in like a violet robe with like makeup on or something. And so there is there is that inaccuracy. Um, I think not so much an inaccuracy as just a sort of a failure to realize is that, you know, people say, ah, you know, the Athenians, they, they were it was a democratic culture. And it was if you were a, an elite male over 18 you had a vote. So again, democracy has evolved over the years. So there's there's more a matter of, um, rather than inaccuracies, than taking what the modern concept is and giving the Greeks credit for it when really it has spent a lot of hundreds of years evolving. And I, I would have loved to have seen some of those statues like painted. I think that would have been fabulous. It would have been bright and colorful and practically garish, I think. Um, and that has affected some interior design and, and, and movie sets and things like that. So. Um, I, I wanted to ask something kind of just, it's a little bit more of a modern context of something. Um, and 
it's about um i believe if i can remember what it was there's a massive statue that used to exist a long time ago and it was a statue of helios in greek culture and i some reason can no longer remember the name of that statue and they tried to rebuild it or there was a plan in 2018 to bring it back to life do you know anything about that specific statue i the largest statue of the ancient world i can think of is the colossus of rhodes yes that's the exact one okay. they wanted to rebuild it and i don't know what else has been going on with it i don't know that it did um yeah the colossus of rhodes yeah was i don't know the original size or anything but it was it did it, it stood out as one of the great one of the great um building projects of antiquity so pyramids colossus of rhodes library of alexandria um and yes it, it would be there what is interesting now is is i guess what this goes back to the question about inaccuracies and is it's there's a lot of you know we we tend to look to the past to find um support for the present um so i can't speak to the colossus of rhodes and this is probably not a great example but for example um uh, Saddam Hussein try, had a replica of the great Ishtar Gate of Babylon rebuilt. That The actual bricks of the Ishtar Gate of Babylon are in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, but because it spoke to this time in, in back in history of when, when Babylon was the big city of the era, so rebuilding the gate sort of speaks to taking ancient achievements and making them relevant in different ways for modern culture. And that's not unique to the Babylonian gate. So Colossus of Rhodes, I think would be the same sort of thing, but I don't know anything more about that, I'm sorry. Oh, and back to classical music, just because I'm, I'm looking at Elsa Marie is like, yeah, the Greeks didn't have classical music, of course. So sadly, even that's a problem, right? So. <laughs> and, and no music notation. Right. Which, but they, yeah, that's right. But they did create the modes, which is so interesting. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cohen, um, I just wanted to say thank you. This was absolutely extraordinary. And for the Odyssey Plate students, your timing is so perfect, right in the middle of the Odyssey and the Penelope, Penelope ad. It's just phenomenal. But oh, thank point, you, Kate, for that. Yeah. Yeah. It just, this was just extraordinary. I, I want to plant a little seed, Dr. Cohen, if I may. If you ever feel that you want to take a trip called Great Expeditions with Honors to the Middle Mediterranean. Oh, that would be kind of fun. Students would <laughs> sign up, including me, in hordes. I think this would be the most exciting possibility. So if you ever need company on one of your trips to the Middle East, oh, let sure. us know. <laughs> I, will, I will think about that. That could be kind of fun. It's, it's hot and dusty, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I just I thought I'd plant the seed and I so yeah. I'll be quiet. If, if, if we are ever able to travel again post pandemic, I, I will consider that. So I know. Yeah. I know. Um, I think once the pandemic is over, we will all just start moving around <laughs> and traveling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh wait, I see a question. Oh, Percy Jackson. Ooh, that was a horrible movie. Sorry, that was my personal opinion that that was a bad movie. I apologize no, to everybody. Um, you're right. <laughs> okay, so Elisa asked. Sorry, sorry, I actually, do you mind if I answer that? that or do you need yeah, to read yeah. the question? Do you I need to read have it? I to read it out loud. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Sorry. Think, yeah. What do you think of lots of young people reading the Percy Jackson books and other modern interpretations of Greek and Roman culture? Do these new fantasy series inappropriately influence our view of the ancient world? That's a really, you see, that's interesting because. You know, nobody objects when, or maybe people do object. I'm not a scholar of Elizabethan literature, but you know, when Shakespeare is done on skateboards and roller skates, I mean, it's the same sort of question, right? The modern movies, like, on the one hand, this is that's the whole idea of a classic, right? Is a classic can be reinterpreted, and you can do King Lear in, um, oh, who's the author who did that? Jane Smiley, who set King King Lear in Kansas or some Midwestern state. The problem, I think, with the Percy Jackson one is it, I don't know about inappropriately, but it's it's not if you're if you're if you're worried about historical accuracy, they're not so great. One of the things that I've always found interesting is that we give the Greeks all this credit for many, many, many things which they deserve, but we always talk about Greek mythology instead of Greek religion. 
in part because, of course, the Western religious traditions come from an entirely different place, which is the subject of a whole other lecture, and then the Greek mythology. And I think people are more inclined to play fast and loose with something if it's relegated or, den or, or denigrated to mythology rather than belief. Um, but so I don't know. That's kind of a wishy-washy answer because I think I think it's good for people to know about the ancient world. I think it would be bad if they take that as the as their sole source of information. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. If not, I do want to be respectful of your time, yeah. uh, Dr. Cohen, and all you participants, because we are nearing the hour, and Dean Lee. So, um, if I'm last call for questions, and I did put the attendance link in the chat for mm -hmm. all of our Czechs and Critics students, uh, please feel free to copy and paste that into your browser. It's not going to be a clickable link. Um, we are getting. Uh, one response that the server may be overloaded right now. Um, <laughs> Go figure. So, <laughs> Dr. Cohen, you have so many people here. So, <laughs> like, okay. uh, no, I think it's the time of day. Everybody gets on their WebEx. I had to move our department <laughs> meetings because too many really? people were on. So, so, but, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But so, well, I thank you again. If, if no one has any more questions, are you going to? So. Oh, there is a cat. Okay, my cat didn't join, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. This was a wonderful discussion. Everybody say thank, thank you, you all for coming. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Have a wonderful afternoon, and um, you too. I will maybe see people one day. You know, when we're unmasked. So. Absolutely. I'm so glad to have seen your full face. <laughs> yes, it's, it's nice to see you as well. So, all right. Thank, thank you all. Have a yeah. have a fabulous afternoon. All right. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye, Bye. Dean Lee. Bye everybody. Bye, Dr. Cohen. Thanks again. Bye. I'm gonna end the meeting here. Yeah. Bye.